Welcome to today's webinar. My name is Randall Krantz with the Global Maritime Forum, and I'll be leading the discussion today. We're going to be talking about uh, life cycle analysis and why it's important. Um, before we get started to that, I just wanted to say this is a, a, another insight briefing webinar, part of the Getting to Zero Coalition's Fuels and Technologies Workstream. Um, today, we'll be looking beyond the colors of the fuel, uh, a life cycle analysis of GHG emissions for marine fuels. As you have just heard, this session is being recorded, and uh, that means that it's on the record. It also means that it'll be available on YouTube following um, the session itself. So what are we going to be discussing today, and um, why are we doing this? So one of the questions is, why is life cycle analysis important? Where are we now? Uh, what we see right now is that in discussions about fuels for uh, the future of the uh, maritime industry, we tend to have a lot of conversations about colors, about uh, green hydrogen, uh, green methanol, um, uh, blue fuels, um, but that tends to uh, actually lead us to more questions. You know, what is green methanol? Is it biomethanol? Is it bio-based point source carbon that's been synthesized with uh, renewable hydrogen to create a, um, a different kind of green methanol? Is it uh, methanol that's derived from direct air capture and uh, renewable hydrogen? There is a lot of different options and the specificity of green and blue is not always quite enough to tell us exactly what we're dealing with. Um, similarly, there's other colors, um, brown, gray, blue, turquoise. Um, I've heard lots of different ones. And what does it mean for blended fuels? If you have a fuel that is um, partly made from fossil fuels, but be blended with a molecularly identical fuel because perhaps of availability, perhaps because of uh, engine restrictions, what does that mean? Does it have a certain color or can an LCA a life cycle analysis tell us a little bit more about that fuel, what we're using, how we're using it. So we're going to explore this today. We're going to explore whether LCA is the perfect solution. We think it's not quite yet, but there's some, uh, there's some things to be improved upon. And we're going to talk a little bit about the role of standardization and regulation. So thank you for joining us today. Um, before we get started, what I'd like to do is we're going to run a little poll just to see how familiar you or your organization is with LCA. This gives us an idea of who our audience is, um, how familiar this topic is. So if we can go ahead and uh, launch that poll. There we go, you can see it. So the question is, how familiar are you with life cycle analysis for marine fuels? You have to pick one of these. Is this something that your organization is already using for uh, investment decisions? Is it something that your organization is figuring out how to deal with and what it means for your operations? Is it something you, your organization is interested in? So maybe exploring a little bit. Is it something you've read about, heard about, you kind of know what LCA means, or is this something that's completely new to you, don't quite know what it means yet. Um, so go ahead, pick which one of those makes the most sense to you. It just gives us an idea. Um, I'm watching the answers coming in. It looks like we've got um, a little more than half of our folks who have answered that. So another couple of seconds, and uh, that's probably enough. We're at about two thirds, so we can go ahead and share those results. What I'm seeing is basically there's a pretty even split across the, um, uh, the, the different speakers. Um, so if we can end that poll and share the results, there we go. Um, so we can see. So most of the people are saying that this is something that um, uh, the organization is figuring out uh, how the fuel impacts their uh, fuel LCA impacts uh, your operation. So that's really interesting. Um, and then uh, smaller numbers are already using this for investment decisions. Um, so it seems like we have kind of a bit of a, a bell curve there where it's something there's a, a good level of familiarity, which is great because that'll allow us to have uh, an interesting conversation. As part of that conversation, please use the chat. Um, please make sure you send your chat to everyone so that we can all see the questions. So ask questions, feel free to pop those in there and we'll bring them to the attention of our speakers. So now I'll introduce our speakers and then we will dive in. So first we'll have Alexandra Ebbinghaus, General Manager of Decarbonization at Shell Marine followed by Frida Fung, who's an independent, independent consultant out of Hong Kong with Fung Research. Then Matthew Williams, decarbonization strategy manager with Lloyd's Register. And Ingrid Marie Vincent Anderson, head of decarbonization targets and LCA at AP Muller Maersk. So uh, thank you all for joining us today. And with that, Alexandra, I'd like to hand over to you to talk to us a little bit about the main difference between colors and LCAs and, and potential drawbacks of, uh, of an LCA approach. Over to you, Alexandra. Hi, Randall. Uh, can you hear me? We can hear you. 
Yeah, no, it's because my computer failed and I'm on the phone, so I don't have the screen. So on the first slide, please. Um, so a color scheme is really an easy way to categorize fuels that are chemically identical to differentiate between production pathways. I'm taking here ammonia as an example, as it does illustrate the point quite well. However, because it is just basically hydrogen and nitrogen and some energy and voila, there you have your ammonia. So typically today the production is using LNG as a feedstock. So what you have is, you know, you produce your LNG, you go through the SMR process to uh, produce some hydrogen and then you just combine it with nitrogen coming from the air separation unit and the Haber-Bosch process and voila, there you have your ammonia. So typically that is recognized as being gray, a gray ammonia. So next slide please, um, Lara. So if you go green, green is associated with renewable ammonia. So you have your wind, solar, hydro, you know, your renewable energy, and that is feeding via it electrolysis to produce your hydrogen. You can use it in the air separation unit to produce your nitrogen. Your harbor bosch process also then is uh, using green energy, and everything is green, and you have a green ammonia. Next slide, please. So what is the color, though, if you're just having hydrogen coming from green energy? And the harbor bosch itself the process energy and everything is fossil fuel. If your air separation unit is also coming from fossil fuel, if, for example, to make up the variability of your renewable energy, you're using grid electricity to basically ensure a constant production process. Is that still green? I mean, what is the actual definition of green? What is the understanding? So if you go to the next slide, you also have blue ammonia. Blue is associated with a fossil fuel where you're actually capturing the and storing the CO2 emissions associated with the process. So you could go via the SMR process and, and basically capture the CO2 coming in the syngas, or you could also capture the uh, carbon which is associated in the flue gases. And depending on the scope of your CCS, the capture rate could be up to 60% or over 90%. And clearly that is all then covered as blue, but the impact you have on your actual greenhouse gas emissions will be very, very uh, different. So really what we are, and, and of course, you know, CCS could also be associated with the actual production process of your LNG, um, you know, associated uh, the process energy to, to clean and process a gas, for example. So the whole definition, there's a lot of variability in it. So if you go to the next slide, the real advantage then of an LCA approach is that you're replacing a color with an actual value. And how do you do that? So on the left-hand side, there's a schematic of um, a methane to ammonia plant. So you basically look at all the energy use, all the emissions associated with the processes. And you start from where the feedstocks are coming from. So you look at your air separation unit, you look at where the uh, fossil fuels coming from, you look at where the renewables are coming from, whether you use grid electricity, et cetera, and actually produce a value. On the right-hand side, uh, this is an abstract from a, a paper which basically has done that analysis for a range, a wide range of different processes. And as you can see, I highlighted in green the processes which we would call renewable. There's a vast difference. If they're still all looking good compared to, to other options, but there's quite a difference really inside the color green. So in summary, Really, the color coding is useful for a general discussion to say, you know, what we're talking about. But in the end, though, the emissions benefit should steer the decision on what fuel to use, the actual value and not the color 
And that is also true for the policies. We can't just put everything together because really if you are looking at blue and a green, you could have the same value on the greenhouse gas emissions. So that's what I just wanted to say with the, the difference of the role of a color versus where really the benefit sits for the LCA. Thanks to you, thank Anders. Thank you, Alexandra. Thank you very much. And, and thank you for overcoming the uh, technology difficulties and, and being able to dial in by phone. Um, uh, interesting. So the key takeaway that I'm hearing is that we really want to make sure that we can quantify, as you put it, the emissions benefit and make sure that we're working on actual values, because if we're just doing colors, A, there could be a lot of variability in there, but also there's a, a lack of specificity in terms of uh, what actual process we're referring to and therefore what is the actual emissions benefit. Um, so thank you very much for that. Uh, Frida, I'd like to turn to you now. Um, you're based in Hong Kong. You uh, have uh, some different perspectives, but also um, one of the things that we spoke about uh, during our briefing was the role of um, uh, having clarity of life cycle impacts of marine, uh, of marine fuels when we're dealing with policymakers and industry both. Um, how does it help uh, impact what we're looking at for investment decisions, but also for policies? Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, let me share my screen first. Great, that works. That works, okay. Um, yeah, excellent. So um, first of all, thank you for having me today, Wendell. Um, I just want to share a little bit perspective um, from Asia about why the LCA really matters um, and, and why we pick Asia as an example here, because um, as you all know that Asia is the center of shipping activities. There's a lot of ships coming here, but also it is the center of shipbuilding. So like Asia, in Asia, we have South Korea, Japan and China accounting for uh, more than 90% of ships being built. So we have seen uh, quite a number of activities, um, uh, incentive schemes, and also policies for promoting clean shipping launched in these three countries um, in the last several years. And I just put a few examples here on my slide showing, for example, like South Korea has a very ambitious scheme that uh, many of you may know um, that costs uh, 870 million to build different new ships, which will fit uh, existing ships and expand the fuel infrastructure. And those cover a wide range of um, technologies like LNG, uh, ammonia, electricity driven um, propulsion, hybrid, etc. Um, and for China, they are also right now looking at a lot of different options, technology options. But um, from the very recently announced um, five year plans and also their plan for uh, achieving uh, 2030 peaking carbon emissions, you can see that, for example, Guangdong has picked LNG as a technology in the near term um, to convert 1,500 river vessels and also to build 19 LNG bunkering facilities. At the same time, the State Council at the national level, they are looking at promoting electric LNG vessels and also to demonstrate green smart technologies um, for river coastal shipping. So that will interpret as um, also supporting hydrogen or ammonia fueled vessels. But all this Initiative actually behind that is an understanding about certain technologies that can deliver some greenhouse gas benefits. But ultimately, whether or not they can deliver a lot of benefits also depends on where the fuels come from. So it would be very useful for, I think, for policymakers when they're making all this investment and also plans that will trigger investment in their country for shore side and also for ship, um, ship side investment. Um, they also understand what's the implication holistically, not only just from the propulsion side, but also on the fuel side. Um, so China is a good example because if we look at um, the different types of fuel, uh, hydrogen being produced in different ways in China, um, this is from the IEA report. And you can see that using the current grid electricity to produce hydrogen, actually the purple spot shows the carbon intensity. It actually has the highest hydrogen intensity than even um, hydrogen derived from coal. Um, and of course with CCS, um, natural gas derived um, hydrogen and coal derived hydrogen could have lower 
uh, CO2 emissions, but not as good as renewable derived hydrogen. So uh, the LCA process actually could help policymakers not only in looking at the technology, but also looking at how they could actually link the field that's going to fit into those technology and where those investments should go into. And um, China has made an attempt to do that. Uh, actually, it's an industry-led effort, uh, which you can see that a um, what they call a China hydrogen certification standard has been released just a few, mo few months ago. And they label, they put three labels there for hydrogen, a very simplistic way. Um, for low carbon hydrogen, they said that life cycle emissions should be 14.51 gram CO2 equivalent per kilogram of hydrogen, which actually allows um, CCS coupled with natural gas derived hydrogen and coal be stay within that, and even just natural gas within, <laughs> without CCS. Uh, they also have two other labels, which is the clean hydrogen um, and also renewable hydrogen. And for clean hydrogen, it basically is the designed, um, many people believe to include the CCS uh, coupled with natural derived um, hydrogen and also the co derived hydrogen with CCS. Um, and of course, for renewable hydrogen, that really means renewable electricity derived hydrogen. And it's a very simple standard, but at least it provides some kind of a direction to direct investment into producing hydrogen that will be delivering some benefits. But I think. Um, ultimately, as Randall has mentioned at the very beginning, and also the previous speaker, they are far more than just hydrogen. They are also blue, ammonia, methanol, all this. And the whole process actually really matters, not only just talking about the fuel and the technology. So I do think having more, um, uh, more work to be done to make it easier for policymakers to make that decision is very important. And I hope that could be done through either the industry or with the IMO. Um, so that's what I want to share. Thank you. Thank you much. Uh, thank you very much, Frida, for sharing that with us. It's, it's interesting to see um, an attempt at quantification, what that looks like. Um, but of course, at the same time, as you suggest, we can see that despite the complexity in the graph that you showed, that's still only for hydrogen. So it's kind of a subset. It's also only looking at, um, at CO2, not other greenhouse gases. So there's a, there's a range of different um, simplifications that already were drawn into that. Um, um, but it still, it serves as something better than just the colors. And you can see that uh, the grams of CO2 per kilogram of hydrogen is a potentially useful metric that could be used. With that, I'd like to turn to Matthew Williams. Matthew, um, over to you to talk a little bit about um, the role of um, uh, LCA in regulation and what is the role of uh, regulation in helping us or not helping us sort this out. <laughs> thank, thank you very much indeed for the uh, the introduction, Randall. Really appreciate it. Um, I, I think I'd just pick up on a, a point that's really come out uh, from the first two speakers as, as well, Alexandra and, and Frieda, is that if it doesn't make the situation clearer, what's the point? Um, and, and it's evident that, that using colors um, creates a, a great deal of un more uncertainty than it solves. And, and Frida rightly pointed out, there's a, there's a substantial investment required, both as sea and ashore in the, in, in the order of, uh, of a trillion dollars. Um, and, and, and the investment or the accelerating that investment um, to support um, shipping's maritime energy transition um, isn't going to happen um, whilst these uncertainties uh, remain. So I think that the case has very clearly been made already for the purposes of clarity purely um, for, for life cycle analysis or life cycle assessment um, to be the benchmark about we assess um, the life cycle performance um, of, of marine energy carriers and power sources. In terms of, of regulators at the moment, the IMO is, is cognizant, I think is probably the best way of putting it, of, of life cycle um, emissions. Um, it still wants to focus on regulating um, ships emissions on an operational basis, but it recognizes that to avoid um, unintended consequences upstream, it needs to take into account um, the life cycle um, of fuels. Although a little bit like colors, um, until recently, it's been very much focused on another binary way of, of differentiating between fuels, which is a source factor of, of zero or, or one depending on how a fuel is produced. But again, like the colors, 
hide some of the variation and the complexity that Alexandra um, highlighted. Um, default values as well for, for, for well to tank uh, emissions are also being considered, but we know already that there are substantial variations, both in terms of production methodologies and geographies, um, which mean that default values are not necessarily um, perfect, but we're not going to be able to update them unless we have a generally accepted and consistently used um, life cycle assessment um, methodology. And the IMO is still to, to decide on what methodology um, it might wish um, to use to calculate or to undertake um, life cycle assessments, both initially and to keep them updated. The EU, on the other hand, is a little bit further ahead. Um, they're actually incorporating life cycle greenhouse gas um, intensity of energy uh, requirements into the fuel EU maritime regulation and penalties will be payable on the basis um, of the life cycle performance um, of, of fuels under that regime. And that would kick in from 2025. And there's a methodology um, that has been included in that regulation, but is also being proposed to the IMO as well, which would be quite helpful to bring some consistency between the two um, regimes. A couple of other points I'd really like to make are that, that, that colours can't be included in regulation. Um, Regulation is talking about accounting for emissions primarily, um, and colours don't help us do accounting. Colours can't be monetized. One of the key things we need to do in, in terms of industry is create an environment in which there is an incentive to change behaviours and in which we create a market for the supply and demand of alternative energy carriers. If we using colours, we're not helping players in the marketplace monetize and understand uh, the true cost of the life cycle performance of the fuels they're using and the choices um, they um, are, are making. Um, and then we've got to decide how we're going to um, use life cycle analysis um, to change behaviours. Is it going to be something that's incorporated um, into uh, regulation? Um, is it something that is going to be um, guidance as, as the way the, the IMO is, is currently looking at it, what's the best way of doing that? There's still a huge amount of, of, of uncertainty around um, what needs to be, um, needs to be achieved by um, regulators. Um, I think I would just um, sort of final or, or, or my closing remark would really be that the colours make the choices that have to be made um, look easier, um, but they make the risks and opportunities of those choices much harder to, to understand. And with the challenge ahead, that's certainly not very helpful. Thank you very much, Matthew. That was very clear. Um, my takeaway there is that colors create uncertainty and uh, the investment can happen with that uncertainty. So we need to minimize uncertainty, being specific, being quantified, being granular about what the emissions are, about what our targets are, whether it's from regulator, regulators, whether it's from investors, we need to know the numbers. So that's fantastic. Um, I'd like to now turn to Ingrid Murray at Maersk. Um, uh, LCA is obviously something that you are an expert on, but it's also something that Maersk is taking seriously. And I'm sure part of the analysis of the decisions that have been made, um, well, certainly that have been made publicly recently, but I'm sure that have been in the pipeline for several years. Um, it'd be great if you could share with us a little bit about um, uh, how Maersk uses LCA and uh, what we can learn from that. Yes, thank you very much, Randall. And uh, yeah, you would think with uh, me having LCA in my job title that I would be an expert, but actually a year ago, I didn't know what LCA was. So it's also been a steep learning curve for me. Um, but I'll try and explain in a simplified way what, what we regard or, or, or how we use LCA in math to assess the fuels that we are looking at um, and what it can and, and cannot do. I just want to make sure that you can see my screen. Oh, good. Good. And I just need to find a way to change it to the next slide. Yes. So, so um, LCA, actually, we talk a lot about of whether LCA should be standardized in, uh, for shipping purposes. But actually, LCA is already standardized. There is a, an ISO standard for uh, how to perform life cycle assessment. Um, and it is a methodology for quantifying um, the sustainability of products like like fuels in this context um, and services. Um, so it is already a pretty well-defined standard. I think the talking in the shipping context could be about how to how to 
apply the standard consistently across different types of fuels. Um, the it's based on, on databases and, and standardized softwares um, so that are also rooted in science. So, so it, is, uh, it is quite a robust tool uh, once it's put into use. Um, and it can be used for greenhouse gas accounting um, as one of the purposes, but it also does a lot of other things. So when we talk about LCA in a climate context, we have to also understand that it's only one of the things that is assessed by, or can be assessed by an LCA. Um, as you can see in my small uh, illustration here, LCA can also be used to quantify uh, impacts of, uh, of products on human health and ecosystems and biodiversity uh, in addition to climate change. So it's not as such a climate change or greenhouse gas tool. It is much more than, much more than that. Um, and the challenge we sometimes encounter, uh, encounter in MERSC when we use LCA um, is that while LCA is standardized, the certifications and the national standards like the EU, for example, they don't necessarily follow an ISO standard approach. So there are slightly different ways of performing LCAs and the, the certification schemes don't necessarily follow the same standard and also you mentioned, Matthew, that the EU is doing something. Uh, that's EU, and but as a shipping company, we buy our fuels all over the world. Um, and it's a bit of a mess to have the same fuel having different greenhouse gas reduction values, depending on where in the world you actually go and procure it and how it's certified. So that's a little bit, it's a little bit of a disconnect between proper LCA and the, and the certification schemes. Um, why we think LCA is really important in what we do when it comes to assessing fuels is that it captures both the direct and indirect effects of the fuel production. So it captures the, the burdens of the feedstock, for example, if we, if we look at biofuels that are uh, induced or, or other uses of that feedstock um, that might lead to a land use change, which is really, really important for the shipping industry to consider that we don't shift our burdens from the shipping industry to, to for example, uh, increased use of farmland or deforestation and so, so on. So we, we see this as a critical uh, assessment tool when we look at fuels and we always carry out LCA of our, of our fuels when we assist them. Um, and then we come to the question of well to wake versus LCA and uh, it's sometimes two terms that, is, that are used interchangeably, but it's, it's really two different things. But the, where the will to wake more defines the boundary of the, of the analysis. And we truly believe that an LCA should always be carried out uh, on the full whale, will to wake uh, footprint of a fuel flow all the way from the, from the extraction or cultivation of the feedstock to the combustion of the fuel. And it also needs to consider all relevant greenhouse gases and other emissions pieces um, for, the, for the purpose, as well as uh, using the appropriate uh, global warming potential of those greenhouse gases. Um, so I'll go to the next slide. So we, I just made this uh, presentation of, uh, for illustrative purposes of why colors are not so useful. I much agree that, that the colors of the fuels, first of all, there's not really any general consensus of what they actually mean. And there can also be great variation within a color of the fuel. So for example, here, what we define as green fuels is, is uh, fuels that are made from hydrogen that come from electrolysis of water and the carbon in the fuel is biogenic if there's carbon in it. And as you can see, there's great variation between different kinds of green fuels, depending on whether they're made from first generation uh, feedstocks or second generation feedstocks and also depending on the pathway. And even this, these are just illustrations. There will be many more variations depending on the electricity mix that goes into this and depending on where in the world the feedstock is sourced from and so on. So this is just a very simplified picture actually. And it also shows that for, for the gray fuels, um, some of them, uh, even even from a from an LCA perspective, if all greenhouse gases are considered, have a higher footprint than the fuels that we are actually trying to the fossil fuels that we are trying to replace. 
So gray ammonia or gray hydrogen can actually be worse from an LCA perspective than, than the fossil fuels that we use today um, if the carbon is not, not captured. I didn't have a lot of data for the blue part. So obviously if the carbon is captured, that will change this dramatically. But it's just uh, it's just to show that that we we don't really regard the colors as anything else as just a classification of pathways. We we really need numbers, and we don't just need one number. We need several numbers per fuel type we look at to actually quantify the the life cycle effects of that fuel. So yes, that's a very brief intro from me on uh, what we are looking at in MASK. Wonderful. Thank you, Ingrid Marie. Um, certainly, we're hearing that um, <clears throat> while LCA is standardized, it's not necessarily being used consistently. So there's still opportunities for improvement there. Um, uh, and that the well to wake or wind to wake, uh, which is obviously kind of getting framed in different ways these days with renewable energies, is really the, the boundaries of what you're doing. But it's not necessarily the exact same thing as LCA. So the LCA is operating within those boundaries. And then finally, you were suggesting there, um, uh, LCA should cover all relevant greenhouse gases and both 20 and 100 year global warming potential. And I think we'll come back to that in the conversation. So thank you all for, uh, for your opening remarks. Um, one question that I'd like to just uh, open up to the, to the group would be um, this role of uh, standardization of, of adoption of LCA. So Ingrid Marie, I think hit on it last that um, it's, it's about consistent application. Um, what is it that we can do to ensure that it's being applied consistently, whose responsibility is that, um, and and what might that process look like? There's a, you know, investors obviously have uh, interest in having that transparency and quantified uh, elements. Uh, regulators do as well, but so do uh, ship owners and charters and others. Um, so maybe just to to open that to the floor, um, uh, to, to the panel rather. To um, uh, what are your thoughts and comments on that? And uh, also just for people, keep your questions coming in the chat. We'll bring those into the conversation. Who wants to comment on that first? Matthew, you unmuted first, so. I can, oh, sorry. No, then over to you. No, no. Yeah. So yeah. I think what we, what we see in MERSC is that, is that uh, the certifications or the standards were developed with some purpose. And for example, the EU Renewable Energy Directors, that was developed with the purpose of uh, incentivized uptake of more, more green fuels in EU. And that's great. And then there are similar standards in the US that serve pretty much the same purpose, but they are not necessarily aligned. And it gets a bit messy when you as a ship owner try and do something on an international basis where you buy fuels in the international market. And then there's a, a real lack of a, a global standard um, for the fuel. So for us, it, it's difficult to tell the fuel makers what standards to use because they are all, they are all different. <laughs> and they're not consistent with proper LCA, any of them. So, so um, th there's a need for, for uh, some level playground on this uh, for the shipping sector, I think. Thank you, Marie. Matthew, do you want to comment on that? Yeah, certainly. I mean, fr from the shipping perspective, the IMO very clearly has a role to make sure that it, it, it identifies the methodology that shall be used. In, certainly in the context um, of shipping and, and promotes the use of that methodology and, and certification against um, that standard. And, and Ingrid Marie has, has identified the, the, the ISO standards as an option. But I think we also need to recognize that one of the real challenges here is shipping is outside of the Paris Agreement, but its energy solutions are all within it. Um, and, and as a result, it's quite, there's the potential need for IMO to, to, to work much more closely with other UN agencies um, to come up with a much more consistent approach to LCA, which um, can be applied both on the land-based side for the infrastructure providing the energy carriers and, and power sources, and which is also compatible with the shipping side of things. And there's a benefit there. You know, it, it, it's shipping can do its its, de, its maritime energy transition and pursue decarbonisation, um, but it can do it in a way by, that that is using fuels that are also not detrimental to um, the upstream um, and and to na nationally determined contributions under the Paris Agreement. But the method of measuring the impacts and the performance of a fuel is same across the Paris IMO boundary. 
Um, so there's a potentially quite significant work that could need to be done there from a policy perspective. If the private sector and non-state actors um, like um, the Getting to Zero Coalition, for example, don't choose to jump on it and, and make it happen with the stakeholders that are involved there to ensure that those standards are universally applied. And, and so one other question then that kind of stems from that is, um, uh, so good, Marie, you kind of referenced uh, global warming potential using 20 and 100 years and the use of all um, greenhouse gases. Is that the current standard we just discussed? There isn't really a standard. You know, who's using what and, and what additional confusion does that create um, in terms of those two? And I know when we were kind of talking beforehand, there, there's a need to figure this out quite quickly, isn't there? On global warming potential, who wants to comment on a, you know, 20 versus 100, one, the other, both? Go ahead, Ingrid Marie. Yeah, I think as you say, there's not really a very consistent approach in the regulatory landscape on whether to use the 100 year global warming potential or the 20 year global warming potential of, uh, of the greenhouse gases. It's more, I think, comes down to, to a tradition of what is, what is in the current regulations. Um, but when it comes to the perspective of LCA, once you define the, the LCA you want to perform, you also define the goal and the scope of that analysis. And to us, the goal is to reduce global warming on a, as soon as possible. So, and because global warming is, is an urgent uh, problem, we think it also makes a lot of sense to use the global warming potential that fits the time horizon on the pro of the problem we are trying to solve. But of course, it's also a long-term problem. So it doesn't mean that we should either use one or the other, but we need to look at the problem holistically and both look at the short-term and long-term effects of what we do. And different greenhouse gases have different global warming potentials on different time horizons. So we think it's important to, to consider all to have the best picture of the impact of what we're doing. Thank you. Thank you, Ingrid Marie. Frida, your thoughts on this? Yeah, just um, I, I totally agree with what Ingrid just said. And I think I just want to highlight that um, the IPCC report actually just mentioned that the, the methane actually contributed to one fourth of the warming uh, as of today. So, so I do think, uh, as Ingrid mentioned, we do need to look at both the near term and the long term. And the near term really matters especially when we are talking about investment already being made or will be made very soon in the coming few years. So we do need to look at both in order for us to direct the investment in the right way that will address, especially the short-term warming. So, yeah, thank you. Great, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> so then the metrics associated with, uh, with life cycle emission, uh, you know, when we're looking at... Um, uh, how we're using those. We talked a little bit about it on the policy side. What is the role of this when it comes to, um, to for example, banks? Uh, what does it mean? Uh, is it something that we're seeing uptake in? And, and Ingrid Marie, I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit because there was some headlines associated with uh, the Maersk loan associated with your um, uh, methanol uh, procurement. And there was a, a specific bond that was issued. And uh, my understanding was that that had quite a favorable rate. What was the role of LCA in, in that process? And do you see that as something that is going to be likely in the future? But from my perspective, this is something at least the banks we were involved with pay great attention to. And they are very interested in finding out how we actually do assess the climate impact on our fuels and what scopes we consider. So do we consider just the tank to wake part or do we actually consider the full uh, world to wake? And uh, we consider the full world to wake, we consider all greenhouse gases. But we had to make very detailed descriptions to the banks. They paid a lot of, a lot of interest in this and how we go about uh, defining our methodology and also how we quantify the, the different impacts of uh, the fuels, not just on the climate, but also on ecosystems and biodiversity. Great, thank you. Um, there's a question in the chat um, that I'm gonna turn to because it kind of picks up on this. We 
we had a few conversations about um, uh, uh, global standards. And the question here from Ian Brown is specifically on the when side of thing, when a global standard will be applied and when we will know the LCA impact of the fuels available in the market to be able to make the, the decision on which fuels to use, whether we're looking at 2030, 2050 or 2100. Matthew, maybe you can talk about that because I know in our briefing call, we spoke a little bit about the timelines. Yeah, certainly. And, you know, it, it, it's a critical question. I think from an IMO perspective, certainly in the form of guidance on, on, on um, the life cycle assessment values, the outcomes for, for various um, uh, fuel types, we could be looking at, at something a bit sooner than that, certainly before 2025. And I would expect um, hopefully before 2023, but that would be guidance. Um, inclusion of anything in regulation would take longer, um, and I wouldn't expect anything before 2026. And with the inclusion of things in regulation would then come that much greater focus on the need to have a single standard against which LCA is done. Um, so again, we might not see that decided until a little, a, a little bit later on. Um, the EU, of course, has, has made their decision on, or is in the process of finalising their decision really around what their view of life cycle assessment is. That might change um, through the negotiations, and particularly if we see greater alignment between their fuel EU maritime proposal and the renewable um, energy directive. Um, but they are, I would certainly expect to see definitive outcomes from, from, from that perspective um, before 2025, when, when, when that regulation is scheduled to enter into force. Other areas like the United States and, 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 and China in particular, where there is, is also developing interest, at, at least in MRV um, for, for shipping as a, as a precursor to other actions, um, it's yet to, be, yet to be seen. So Matthew, is it safe to say that even if we don't know the exact timelines that we should be looking at a full well to wake LCA for all greenhouse gases um, and that this is this regulation will be coming from the IMO. We just don't know exactly when, but in, when we're looking at investments for the longer term, we should be prepared for that now. Is that? Um, I would like to be able to give a definitive answer on that. I think there are there are many of us that would like to see um, formal inclusion of well to wake LCA in, in, in IMO regulation, but there is still a lot of uh, resistance to that on the basis that IMO regulates ships and, and the yep. operational um domain of ships so what i would probably say is is if there is an appetite and i think there is for for life cycle assessments to be of well to wake emissions to become a norm from an industry perspective purely for the purpose of starting to clear the plot of uncertainty and say look we know this is the objective for 2050 we know what we need to do um, to get there We've, we've got life cycle assessments for the various fuels that we, we, we that, that are available to use now and we think will be available to use over time. Um, give ourselves the information to go after the objective. Um, and there's going to, you know, for certain segments of the industry, there's going to be real pressure from cargo owners to get on and do that as a result of like, the cargo owners for zero emissions um, vessels and, and their announcements at, at COP26. And the resulting level of ambition, which is 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 actually ahead of what the IMO would would try to achieve. So, you can sit around and wait for regulation, or given those existing standards out there, we can get on and do it. Yep. Randu, if Alexander, I may, please. Add, yeah, if I may add the the view from a fuel supplier's perspective. So, if we're producing hydrogen, that hydrogen will go into all kinds of industries. It's not dedicated only to the marine sector, same for ammonia or all other fuels. So basically you need to prove you have to have a certificate and the supplier really, you know, it doesn't make sense to have a different certificate of different values depending on where the end use it because the, the product is the same. So I think I, I would call for, yes, we need to have an alignment on the standards, what Matthew was saying, it needs to not just be specific for maritime, it also should look at what others are doing so that you can actually also look at the practical elements of how do you determine it, put it into practice with associating it with specific bunkers going to the vessel. It's, it's all good to have, you know, an academic view of, you know, how complex the calculations, what can all be included, it needs 
to be also implementable from the point of view of following the certificate of verifying the emissions and ensuring that everything is on Pidori. Excellent. Thank you, Alexander. So while the IMO regulates only the um, marine piece of this, the fuels that we're getting are going are the same fuels and the same feedstocks are being used across multiple industries. So additional advantages of having some consistency and clarity there across those industries. Indeed. Great. One other question, Alexander, maybe for you to take while um, we've got you on, is there's a question about the carbon footprint of constructing, deploying, operating all the facilities required for renewable energy use in these calculations. And I think the question was just kind of clarifying, is that all taken into account when we do an LCA is the kind of that full life cycle? My, my assumption is the answer is yes, but just wanted to check with you on that. Not really. I mean, it depends on, on the scope. So what you typically do today uh, when you look at, at fossil, the fossil fuel infrastructure is not included. So, you know, the steel to produce the offshore facility um, is, is not part of the life cycle analysis. Usually it's assumed that it's there and it's, you know, basically, you know, that was a design decision. Uh, I've seen some data when you look at... Um, building renewable power for, for wind or for solar, which are specifically, you know, built to produce your hydrogen or ammonia, should you then not include it? And that could actually be something equivalent to something like 14, 15 megajoule per um, uh, CO2, gram CO2 per megajoule, sorry about that. Uh, so it would be a significant increase, but that is a decision or uh, discussions to be had, what is a more appropriate scope. But at the moment, the energy used to actually build the solar panels, the wind turbines is not included in most assessments. Okay, great, very useful. Thank you, Alexandra. Another question from the uh, the chat that came from uh, Connor Fustenberg Stott was around the role of science-based targets and how they um, work with uh, with LCA. So we're expecting uh, that the science-based target uh, initiative uh, releases quite soon, I believe, in, in, in the spring, uh, sh some shipping guidelines um, that will take in the whole life cycle uh, approach and uh, all JHGs. Collectively, what's your expectation of, of how in practice the market will apply that, um, particularly in the interim, kind of before the uh, IMO regulates it? Is this kind of an interim standard that we're looking for? Is it something, is it something else? Is it something that'll cause more confusion? Or is it something that actually will be um, a gold standard level type of thing? What do we see from science-based targets and LCA? I think, I think, Randall, from my perspective, if it doesn't include colors, it makes life better. It makes life more straightforward brings that clarity that, that is needed. I haven't seen um, the standard. I, I haven't been in, in, involved in that. Um, but certainly if it's, a, if it's a quantitative assessment based on the existing um, standards that are out there and against which certification could be apply, applied in a uniform way across the whole supply chain, then it can potentially be very powerful and very helpful. Thank you very much, Matthew. Uh, Ingrid Murray, you wanted to come in on that as well. Yeah, thank you. Obviously, we haven't seen the final guidance from the SPTI yet for the shipping sector. But as far as I'm concerned, I believe it doesn't include a standard for how to assess the world to wake emissions of marine fuels. But it does include a requirement to set targets based on the world to wake emissions of those fuels. Um, and usually the SPTI makes reference to the greenhouse gas protocol. Um, and that has to do with the scope. So the, the scope one emissions have to do with what comes out of the fuel when you burn it on board the ship. And then scope three will be the upstream emissions um, that happen when you make the fuel. And the sum of that will be the well to wake emissions. So that's what you have to use as basis for your, um, for your target. And I believe reference is made to some standard values for, for existing fuels, for the fuels we use today, so that you can calculate Late your well to wake baseline, but I'm not sure how um, if the SPTI will go about the standard values for or how to determine the values well to wake for future fuels. Yeah, so that will that we will see, but I don't know, I don't believe it will be a standard for how to to calculate the values. Okay, 
Right. So it sounds like that's a little bit of a wait and see, but hopefully some of those answers are forthcoming over the coming months when we see that standard when it comes out. Um, but uh, Matthew, as you said, if it's not colors, it's a step in the right direction and it'll certainly help. Um, and, and I think that's what we're hearing uh, across the board here. The, the one thing that came up a little bit earlier that I'd like to come back to is the, the role of demand. So we, we talked uh, quite a bit about the role of policymakers in, um, in, in mandating uh, LCA, but when we referenced the role of other stakeholders in the value chain, and Matthew, I think you referenced the, the, the demand side that was present um, in advance of and in COP, so the, through the COZEV initiative, um, um, but also the First Movers Coalition that was launched in COP. I mean, that's two examples where they're looking at quantification of zero emission fuels as part of those supply chains. Presumably that's another signal where if you're going to be dealing and uh, supplying to certainly those who are being vocal on that side, then quantifying and using an LCA is something that you're going to um, have up your sleeves and be practicing right now. Uh, 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 absolutely. And, and whilst at the moment, most mar or many market-based measures, for example, are focused on um, operation would be focused on operational emissions. Should in the future we see um, measures that that do look at the whole life cycle, then it may well be that the, the tonnage owner and the cargo owner um, is going to to, to have to um, have a much closer relationship over the LCA um, of, of of the energy carriers that are are being used because they may wish to transfer costs um, in addition to. The need to to keep um, the the scope three emissions um, of, of the cargo owners um, to a minimum, and I think once we see a, a, a almost a, get to the stage where we're seeing general um, convergence towards improved operational emissions, the attention will very much focus on the differentiator, which will be potentially could be about um, the, the the well to tank element of the uh, emissions associated with ships. But it all depends on where the boundaries of any arrangements between the cargo owners and the tonnage owners are set. Um, and it may be that it doesn't go as far as LCA. We just have to wait and see. Frida, from your perspective, um, is this what you're seeing in terms of um, uh, in terms of the, the this boundary um, that uh, that Matthew referenced in between kind of cargo owners and operators? This idea that um, improved operational emissions as we kind of get there, presumably with the addition of improved transparency starts to allow for different decision-making. Are you seeing that as well in Asia? Well, I, I think not so much in Asia in general, but I think um, the customer's pressure actually not so much coming from Asia, but from, from elsewhere. But, but I also, also want to point out that um, uh, referring back to an earlier comment uh, about LCA and Alessandro just mentioned, actually the uh, hydrogen standard that I talk about derived for China is actually derived for all industry. So it is not specifically for marine. And that's the need for that because China is now making all this investment into hydrogen production. And they see a way of having some clarity on what does it really mean by green hydrogen. Uh, that's the reason why they have the certification. So, so I don't think that is uh, so much in Asia from the customer side, but mm. from the policymaker side, I do see the need for some clarity on that. And so I think that all goes in line together when the customers are demanding it, from the Western world, we call it the Western world, but then the policymaker is responding, but they want to respond in a way that will be matching the need from the customers. Okay, great, thank you. So we've got just a few minutes left. Maybe the, the one thing that we can close on would be exploring about, um, you know, what is it that we can do? We, we're, we're so far talking a lot about what others can do uh, on LCA, but there's a role for um, uh, each of us as, uh, as players in this broader space. There's a role for the Getting to Zero Coalition and all of its members. We've got some good critical mass uh, within, within our own community. Um, and there's plenty of other uh, leader communities that are, that are coming up um, uh, across the board and across that value chain as well. So maybe the, the final question that we'll close on will be, um, while we're waiting for this additional certainty, while we're waiting for regulation, some of these things we know will take a couple of years. What is it that we could be doing? What is it that those who are listening to this conversation can be doing over the coming year, over the coming two years? Maybe, Alexandra, I'll start with you. Yes, thank you, Vandal. Um, 
I think it's education, you know, that everybody needs to understand the, the principal differences between tongue to wake, veil to wake, just CO2, including all greenhouse gas emissions. And I think there's a role for everybody here to to really spread that message. You know, how do you, what, what impact does it make and how does it actually change your decision making? Uh, Matthew was making a comment on, on the regulation. Currently, everything is CO2 tongue to wake. The EU is putting forward with Fit for 55 a way to wake approach. So there is Thing, there are things happening in, in the background and, and we really need to educate people on the differences and that will then lead automatically, I think, to everybody using proper values on a way to make basis for decision making. Thank you, Alexandra. Frida, what can we yeah, be doing? I, th <laughs> I think another thing, um, I, I, I concur with what um, Alessandro just mentioned, um, more education is really needed to understand the, the complexity of, of um, the fuel life cycle emissions. But another thing to take a look at is also how to make it enforceable in the end. I think that's a lot of lessons that can be learned from the certification of different fuel for different sectors. For example, for automobile sector, that's already an LCA. Um, not, not so much for the LCA for carb, uh, for all the aspects, but for carbon, like in California, how they actually certify it, how they actually enforce it. Those are the things that also need to take into account when we develop the standard to make sure that when we apply it to the international trade, um, it actually can be applicable and be enforceable. So that would be another thing that we need to consider. Great. Thank you, Frida. Uh, Matthew, to you. I, I agree with, with Alexandra's point about, about understanding um, what's happening. I would expand on that slightly by, by starting to take an interest, if, if not already, in, in what the life cycle um, impact of, of the energy carriers you're using or providing is. Um, it's inevitable that some form, this is going to be taken into account in some form or another, um, so understanding what it really means for you, even if you, you know the standards aren't perfect, would be a great place to start. And one of the ways of capturing what that could mean is to start to think about if, if you had to apply a carbon price, an internal carbon price, to the life cycle emissions associated with your operations, what would life look like? So the role of an internal carbon price and, and, and basically that shadow carbon price, what would that affect your decisions? I know that's something that Maersk has been doing for, for some time because I, I've had several conversations with your colleagues, Ingrid Marie, on that. Um, but uh, so Ingrid Marie, final question to you, what is it that we can be doing? And maybe one question from Maersk specifically, um, because Maersk is leading the way, um, is there an opportunity for Maersk to learn, to practice, to how to bring this quantification into its communications as well? Because I know the flurry of announcements, some of them were about um, carbon neutral methanol or green biomethanol and other things like that. I'm sure that you're uh, having challenges with, within the organization. How do you communicate this? Because uh, LCA is not necessarily the best thing for headlines either. So uh, how are you facing this uh, right now? No, you're, you're right. It's not that easy to establish a common understanding, not even inside a company of what we mean when we communicate different, uh, different things with regards to fuels and ships. Um, but I think it, it comes down to, to being specific about what you mean. And as Alexandra said, being clear on, on definitions and not, I mean, it is a pretty complicated topic, but it's not that complicated. So we also should not overcomplicate it. Um, but I think as Maersk, what we, uh, what we have realized is that there are standards, there are guys, there are, there are, uh, there are methodologies to do this but we just don't feel that there's something that really entirely works for shipping because many of these standards are sprung out of national or region, regional uh, standards like the EU um, and it's, it's difficult to apply it in a global context so we should review those standards and guides and establish some best practices across the sector I think in the absence of regulation what we can do at this point in time is to establish guides and best practice on how to go about it and, and try to simplify it, but also don't try to oversimplify it because we still need a quantitative approach to this. We need numbers. We cannot just go with red or green or blue or whatever, black or white. This is not black and white. It is 
there's a, a lot of different ways to produce a lot of different fuels and we need the numbers to quantify their life cycle um, impact. Thank um, you. And also now we talk a lot about climate, but I also want to emphasize that we should not forget all the other problems the world is facing, like the biodiversity crisis. So that also needs to be taken into account. That's true. And, and certainly the whole life cycle does allow us to uh, to look at that from some degree. So we've heard a few things. Thank you to our panelists. We've heard that quantification is good. We've heard that we need to be compatible with other industries across geographies. We've heard that we need to understand the, how it influences decision making. There's a role of shadow carbon pricing. We need to wait and see what's happening for EU Fit for 55 and SBTI. And then finally, we need some enforceability around all this. I'd like to thank our panelists for joining us. Thank you, uh, Alexandra, Ingrid Marie, Matthew, you and Frida, and thanks to all of you who joined us and listened in for joining us for another webinar of the Getting to Zero Coalition. We look forward to seeing you next time. Thanks again.